coming out uh, to bullying a family discussion. Um, this is a topic that really impacts us all. It's, it's a topic that we've observed, we've experienced, um, and if we're truly honest with ourselves, we've probably even been the bully at times in our life as, as we've made our life journey. Um, so today we're asking you to come and to be um, the stopper, the protector, and perhaps a better word, a friend that steps in and helps. So th uh, thank you all for coming. Um, before we begin, there's a couple of quick housekeeping things. Um, because bullying is something that is, uh, brings up a lot of emotions in people, we encourage you to take care of yourself um, throughout the evening. If you need to step aside, get a drink, uh, there's refreshments there. Um, thank you to Pizza on Main for providing the pizza. The very awesome and generous of them. Um, the restrooms are out through the main door and across the lobby. And um, so take care of yourself. Child care is right through here. So if you have children over there, uh, you can go out the hall and, and over. You've probably already found it. Um, as you came in, you got a NOM sheet. It's National Outcome Measurements. And that is required by our funders to keep evenings like this going. So. Uh, it's a simple thing they ask. Uh, it's just demographic information. It's nothing identifying. Um, but it's, it just helps to keep the funding going. Also related to keeping the funding going, uh, we have parent surveys. Um, so if you have a student in grades 6 through 9, we'd love for you to take a couple minutes uh, to complete those. And you can trade them in at the back. We have a box of games. Um, and just encourage you to, to spend time with your kiddos. So, um, so thank you for coming out. Um, we are recording, uh, Green Mountain Public Access is recording tonight. If you do not, if you, we wanna make it a safe environment. So if you wanna share something, but you don't want it to be actually in the final recording, you can go and see Maya at the end. Uh, she's looking up at, the, or she's waving at us now. Um, and let her know that please strike your comments from the final recording, because we want this to be a community discussion. Um, so the format for the evening, um, is we're going to have each of our panelists, they're gonna introduce themselves, because uh, they are the experts, um, and then they're gonna spend five to seven minutes sharing um, what their organization or their, how their work supports bullying prevention, and then they'll pass it right down the line, and um, then we'll take uh, like a five minute break. Um, on your table, you each have a stack of note cards. Feel free to write down questions and then when we come back from break, we'll, we'll collect those and uh, start asking questions of our panelists. So again, thank you. So Robin. Hi, I'm Robin Daly and I work for Lamoille County Mental Health. I'm the Children, Youth and Family Services Director. And we're just introducing, yeah. I'm Katina Idle. I'm a cl clinical coordinator at Lamoille County Mental Health and I supervise school-based clinicians which are contracted to work in our public schools. And I'm Katherine Gallagher, superintendent for Lamoille North Supervisory Union, and I have worked in this capacity for three and a half years, and before that I was a um, student support uh, director for this supervisory union. I'm Heather Hobart, executive director of Lamoille Restorative Center. We're a restorative justice agency located in Hyde Park. Ryan Bjorke, I'm the facilities manager at Craftsbury School District, and one of my roles there is uh, one of the designees for any of the bullying complaints that come into the school. And prior to working at Craftsbury, I was a police officer with the town of Morrisville for 23 years. Hi, I'm Donna Sherlock. I'm a parent rep with the Vermont Federation of Families, and I'm also a member of the Children's Standing Committee with Lamoille County Mental Health Services. And I'm Jessica Bickford. I'm the coordinator of Healthy Lamoille Valley. So, Robin? Yay. <laughs> Hi. So uh, I've worked in this field for 20 years and I've worked in this community for 18 of that and I'm so super excited to be here tonight. Um, because my children's standing committee is here, uh, Donna in, I, I think it was October-ish, because October was Bullying Awareness Month, 
was very excited to talk about, hey, what are we gonna do in our community? How are we gonna start this talk? And I was like, I don't know. And here we are in January with a lot of um, conversations and a lot of work. So thank you, Donna, for helping this. And Jessica, thank you for organizing everybody and everybody for being here. Um, I was excited to talk about bullying for many levels because I have like the best job in the world. I get to supervise um, a lot of people that do therapy and case management in our community and they get to do a lot of um, supporting people that have gone through trauma. And tonight I want to make sure that trauma uh, is represented, represented in bullying. So as I was sitting around thinking about what do I want everybody to know? Well, I brought Katina, um, and Christina Glock is sitting in the audience. She also works in our school systems, too, uh, to help support kids with trauma. Um, I wanted to talk about trauma-informed systems. I wanted to make sure that um, everybody knows that this community, a lot of people sitting at this table, have been working on trauma-informed systems, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, making sure that we are all aware of what's going on for our youth and families in this community. So um, when I was doing some research, I was looking at it from a systems lens, I was looking at it from a community lens and a mom lens, and one of the things that shocked me is that one in five high school kids experiences bullying in some sort, one in five. And when they did their fancy math, and my, my, I'll cite my source, it's NCTSN, National Child Trauma Something Network. Um, it's right here, I'll show you later. Stress. Stress, there you go, stress, because I'm stressed. That's eight million children in the United States experiencing bullying. Um, so I was really just thinking about the relationship between trauma and bullying and how we support our families. And I feel like, um, Bullying is present everywhere. I'm not sure that we actually see it in the way that we used to. When I was sort of chatting it up with my children this morning, I was shocked at sort of the apathy and sort of the acceptance of it. Um, my middle schooler was like, oh, it's terrible. It's, it's awful and it's just the way that it is and there's nothing we can do about it. Okay. And then there, she's a seventh grade girl. Um, and then I was talking to my 11th grade boy who was like, that doesn't happen. That stuff's not allowed to happen anymore. Geez, mom, you're wasting your time on this conversation. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. And some other beautiful statistic was, I was trying to think about boys versus girls and that sort of dynamic. And 27% of it is boys and 40% of it is girls. Wow, let's think about it that way. Um, but I, I think the one thing that I, I'm so excited about is that there's a team of people sitting here tonight and there are people that care um, out in the audience and um, education around trauma has increased and we're going to be able to help support families and kids and there's concrete resources over there about what families can do um, and it's not just coming to get case management and therapy but chronic bullying can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder and it can present itself in interesting ways across settings in schools and in homes and in communities so I don't know if I hit everything I wanted to hit but I wanted Katina to come tonight and talk a little bit about some of the work that she's done um, to help support uh, trauma-informed systems in schools thank you You're welcome um, so a big part of my role is supervising clinicians. So schools will contract with us to bring mental health services into schools, which is fantastic. And what we hear a lot of from teachers is that's great because that's not my job. And that's true. And we started to bring trauma-informed trainings to teachers because part of the, one of the biggest resilient factors for bullying, for trauma, for ACEs, is a positive relationship. So if that can be a parent, it can be a teacher, it could be a friend, it could be so many different people. So how do we, as caregivers, be that positive relationship to our kids? How are we gonna help them have the resiliency to stand up when they feel down, or stand up for somebody when they are down? So we have started to go to all of the different school districts and do trauma-informed training. How do you recognize when a kid's behaviors, which we might label as maladaptive, um, are actually very adaptive to their home life, but it doesn't work in school? You know, how do we recognize when 
a kid is actually asking for help, but it looks like they're telling you to go F off. So how do we differentiate? Um, so a big part of it is psycho psychoeducation for any adult. But in the schools, the school-based clinicians provide that psychoed to the kids. Because there's so much about normative development that kids don't understand as normal. Mm -hmm. They feel alone. You know, they feel like, oh, it is normal. You know, that we call these names at home so I can do this name for anybody I want. And it's not normal to say how I'm feeling. So a big part of our work is from the systems level on down to the individual, providing individual therapy in schools for kids that might not receive it any other way, providing groups, psychoeducation groups. Um, so in elementary schools, we'll do lunch bunches and practicing social skills. Moving all the way up into uh, adolescence where you're really talking about your identity and who are you and who do you want to be and being able to have those conversations. So uh, I'm also a parent, I have a younger child and when your kids comes to you and says something or asks a question, as a parent you don't always know the answer and that's okay, mm -hmm. but we don't always feel that way. So how do we as parents then reach out for resources? So there are an amazing plethora over there but also to know that in your schools there are people you, you as parents can go to, which Kat, Kat will talk more about, um, but also that the kids know they have someone in school to go to. So really my highlight is positive relationship really can turn this around as well as psychoed. Um, and I do think there is cultural gender biases around girls versus boys and what is bullying mm -hmm. and what we accept from boys as normal boys will be boys, and as girls is normal, oh, they're just being girls and they're catty. So how we need to own our own cultural biases around gender and behavior. Um, I just saw, my husband showed me this morning, there's a great clip that Gillette is now doing, because you know, Gillette's slogan is like a man, or you know, so they've now changed it and they're doing these whole, what does man actually mean? What does it mean to be a man? Um, which, which is beautiful, but we need to do the same thing for women. And what happens if you don't fall in either of those categories and you're gender neutral? How are we going to help support those kids too? So a lot of it is around discussion, conversation, in the schools, in the classrooms, with parents, and all around. So that's my little split. I'll pass it on over. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I'm Katherine Gallagher. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about where our system is now, where I think we're going, and where we've been. Um, although we have always um, treated bullying seriously, I think in large part we spent a lot of time educating our staff and students on the legal definitions of bullying, harassment, and hazing. And that's this tiny, tiny piece of it. Bullying prevention is really about relationship building. And where we could easily talk about the legal ramifications of bullying and what the appeal processes looked like and made sure that our staff knew what to look for um, in situations, we didn't spend as much time working with the students to see what their understanding is and what their issues were. It was, it was more of a, a top-down model. Um, where we are moving, and uh, we have buy-in from the board, from the community members, from our students, from our staff, is spending a huge amount of our focus on safe and healthy schools. What does that mean? We are affording our staff, and in some cases students, an opportunity to participate in youth mental health first aid. We have provided training in trauma-informed systems. We are looking at implementing restorative practices supervisory union-wide, and that is where we are already seeing dramatic effects. For example, we're actually seeing an increase in bullying referrals, but a decrease in confirmations. So what does that mean? When you look more closely at the referrals, friends of friends are making reports. They're concerned about their peers. We have groups like A World of Difference, 
uh, groups like YATST, which is Youth and Adults Transforming Schools Together, working on what issues they see in front of them. Um, where we really need to go is out to the communities, because the other thing we're finding is that when I meet with a parent, and that's usually after a number of conversations occur um, with other building level staff, they have a story to tell too. And we have a large number of parents who went to school here. Um, they didn't have great experiences. And bullying really wasn't, it was sort of shoved under the, under the carpet two decades ago, three decades ago. We don't shove anything under the carpet now. And with the addition of technology, the likes that we have never seen, we are seeing different kinds, and you touched on this, different kinds of bullying. We're seeing cyberbullying. We're seeing something that is um, nuanced more than it ever has been. So what do our kids need? We think, because we're seeing some results with this, that they need to have a sense of belonging and connectedness. And the way to do that is to start at the, you know, the early years, early education. What does it mean to be a friend? What does it mean to not be a bystander, but to be an upstander? What does that mean to stand up for someone who is not being treated well? Um, what does it mean to value human life? What does it mean to work through uh, and process disagreements? And is it acceptable to do that? So while we are working in each of our schools now to, to have those discussions, it takes time. You can't take a frightened child or a frightened family member and say, we're going to talk about very personal things. So. The restorative piece, and, and this has been an education for me, is not so much about repairing harm to others as it is about building a framework of solid relationships and safety. It starts in the classroom. So all of our teachers, you know, we used to focus on what could the special educators use and need. And when I was a special educator 100 years ago, um, you know, I was the person tasked with coming in and helping a child who was struggling. We all need to help our children. And if we provide our regular education teachers, the teachers that see, see our kids every day, first thing in the morning, throughout the day, with the skills they need to understand what's happening and to, to create a community of safety with the classroom, not for the classroom, but with the classroom, um, I believe we're gonna have more success. So our big focus, student council, um, continuing our work with restorative practices, Heather and Mark um, from the Restorative Center are working with us um, throughout the year to do that. Circles in all of our classrooms at the high school, they call it home base. They do them every single day. Um, at the elementary levels, they look different, but sometimes those circles are about friendship. Sometimes they're about um, how to help, how to engage someone who is new to the classroom. Basic skills that address social emotional well being. So that is our big focus um, forevermore. <laughs> when students can access education because they feel safe and happy and comfortable in their environment, they will be able to access everything else. So that's my, that's my piece. So Kat teed this up really well. Can everybody hear me? Um, Again, I'm Heather Hobart from the Mall Restorative Center, and I think uh, Kat talked about the work that we're doing in the Loyal North District, um, which is this end of the county. Um, our agency is also working uh, with two other school districts, the neighboring school districts, uh, the district Williams. that Ryan works in, um, and Lamoille South, which is Morseville and Stowe and Elmore. Um, so a little bit about us. When people hear the title Lamoille Restorative Center, they often think about people who've um, committed a crime. And we work uh, with many people who have uh, done some sort of harm. And the way we do that work is um, very varied across our agency. Uh, we served just under 900 people last year. 
um, and many of them have uh, done something that we're talking with them about. And sometimes we include the person who was harmed in that conversation. So we're, um, we're seen as, when Jessica called me an expert, I, sh I shudder, but I guess we're seen as experts in how to have those hard conversations, how to repair harm, and help people take accountability for that. Um, what I want to step back and talk a little bit more about is um, the work that we need to do before that which is uh, the focus that we've had in the 20 schools that we're working in this year. Um, I think there's been a little bit of a perfect storm around how we got to this place. And I don't think that this area is unique. I think that uh, bullying is a, a situation that's um, really been compounding over the years. I think teachers have been uh, told explicitly and implicitly that their focus needs to be academics and that there is no time for social emotional development and building community in their classroom. And I see lots of people around the room nodding because they know this to be true. I think Kat can probably also nod to know that historically that's something that we've um, really told teachers uh, and the education system as a whole is the academics matter and everything else doesn't. It needs to stay outside of the classroom. And we know that humans don't work that way. Um, and I think the other thing that uh, has added to this perfect storm is the social media world and how uh, so much of the, the bullying that can happen is in that gray area. Um, and any of us that have children who have access to the social media world right now experience this on a daily basis. Um, I have an 11 year old daughter who's coming to the high school, to the middle school next year, um, and her access to social media is increasing as she gets older. Um, so I'm experiencing it very personally as well. Um, so I don't blame us for being in this place. What I want to talk about is um, the work that we can do in the schools and have been doing in this area. So I left some sheets with our, uh, the title of our agency on the front, just a one page, and on the back is a little pyramid. And Kat alluded to this a little bit. Um, we, it's not safe for folks to jump to when there's a bullying situation. Um, and there's not enough safety in that classroom or in that relationship to start talking about repairing harm. And in fact, what we've now learned, research has shown us that we can do a lot of damage by bringing those people together, right? And people in this room can also probably imagine or have experienced how that can look. Um, and I, unfortunately, having done this now for about 19 years, can remember back to the days when I probably did some harm and brought people together who shouldn't have been brought together. Um, so what we need to do is uh, really work on building a safe uh, school environment and community environment so that people feel comfortable and know how to have conver hard conversations when there is conflict. And bullying is um, in that category of conflict um, that, that I think we have to address. Um, so the work that we're doing, is, as Kat alluded to, is really this year about helping schools build more inclusive environments. Um, and so the circle process that we're training all teachers in the 20 schools on is uh, making sure that everybody's included and every student has a voice uh, so that not the louder students have the louder voice and the, the quiet students don't, um, but that everybody at the table has a voice and that um, the teachers don't necessarily, they're sort of on the same par in this, really, in this relationship and conversation in the circle process, which is a little bit different for teachers. Mm -hmm. um, so we're exploring that too. And really it's a way to build a safe community because inclusive communities actually uh, reduce bullying pretty drastically. I was just looking at this um, book about circles, creating circles in schools, um, and I'm happy to share it with you all afterwards. And in 2004, the US um, Secret Service and Department of Ed put out a, um, a report about threat of major safety issues in schools, particularly school shootings. And what they recommend is emphasizing listening in schools, which we haven't been allowed to do enough of um, until now, I think, adopting a strong, caring stance against the code of silence, so standing up, as Kat said, and preventing and intervening in bullying. So um, this year our work is really on building the positive culture and um, supportive relationships across for all students so that they feel open and honest enough to have the hard conversations and stand up for each other. Next year, the work will be more on 
when harm is done, how we repair that harm. Now, I want to be really clear, and then I'll let Ryan go, um, that I do not believe, and people who do the restorative work are not always advocates for putting folks who've experienced harm and people who've done harm in a room together. That's not always appropriate. Uh, what I do advocate for is using the guiding questions on the bottom of that front page, which is what's the appropriate process, who's been harmed, and what do we need to do to make it right, as opposed to what consequence do you deserve. Mm -hmm. It's a much different way to ask the question, and it, and it prompts a much different response. Go ahead. Thank you. So again, I'm Ryan Bjerke, uh, the facilities manager with the Craftsbury School District, and that covers kind of a broad range of job tasks that I've had, um, aside from just making sure the buildings are working the way they're supposed to. Uh, I have the privilege to be able to work with students directly through, I'm one of their bullying designators, so that means that any complaint that comes forward within the school day, uh, I'm one of two people in the building that will look into those complaints and, and investigate them and then forward that information on to our, our building administrator. Um, we also are doing some, some work with the student leadership and an advisory count committee that meets once a week to discuss ongoing issues within the, within the building. It's trying to really give students a voice um, within their building and have some say over how things work there. Uh, we, they will meet on a pretty regular basis with the principal as well to, to voice those concerns once we've kind of got them boiled down to what we think we really should be focusing on. Um, you know, prior to getting into this role, I was, a, I was a police officer for a number of years and worked for in a school as a resource officer for about seven years over in Morrisville. Uh, aside from that, I was also a detective and worked with the Lamoille Special Investigation Unit, which really focused on um, like sexual abuse crimes, and a lot of those took place online. And a lot of the stuff that we focused on or got called to investigate did have a lot to do with technology. And you see a lot of interactions that are happening now. It's just so easy to get on board and for students to have access uh, to a whole world of people, not just the people that they go to school with. And you know, trying to really do some education around that with students. We'd meet once a year with, uh, with students in middle school at PA and really talk about how do you be safe online, what do you need to be paying attention to. And it always seemed like those conversations went to the interactions they were having with their peers. And what did those look like? And why was it that it was so easy for people to be so much harsher online than it would be in person. And trying to have those conversations about why is that? And we've seen a really a significant change in the way kids communicate with each other. And I think it's really important, and it kind of reiterates um, where Heather and Kat have been talking about, the building relationships and really working with students around how do you communicate with each other? How do you, how do you deal with problems? Because the school is just a small, very organized place to be able to have you know some structured conversations when they get into the the rest of the world mm -hmm. they're not necessarily going to have all the supports there so it's really critical to be able to emphasize how do you do this how do you have these conversations and it's you can see technology and how it's played a role in breaking down how people communicate you know they're not necessarily accustomed to having difficult conversations in person it's much easier just to blast that person mm -hmm. online with insults or whatever they're going to do and not think about the consequences from there Everyone feels really safe behind the shield of their phone. But what the kids also end up is they have to go to school the next day and deal with some of these students. And so how do you, how do you start working through those conversations and getting to those tough topics? Um, you know, so that's where I, I feel fortunate to be able to actually be on that other side of things now. Instead of just responding to stuff, we actually get to work with students and um, work through the, those, those skills that they need. Um, you know, the online piece, you know, I'm a parent, I have a child's almost an adult and I have another student in middle school and it's been a real learning curve for us as well you know so not to say we're better than anyone else because I think we've we've certainly made some mistakes along the way and you know and it's trying to educate like how do you how do you self-regulate and because once once my son leaves he's, <coughs> he's gonna figure it out on his own um, but trying to get some of those good habits put in place now is, is difficult. And there's a lot of devices you can get for your house to make that life a little easier that monitors and sets parameters, which I wish I'd had 10 years ago. Because mm -hmm. um, I think it would help make those habits of how they, how they interact with their devices and how they interact with their peers a little easier to, to accommodate. So we're, we're still learning as well and trying to, trying to do best by our students and, and, our, and our kids. Um, so it's just, it's been a real interesting transition to see how technology has rolled into everyone's daily life mm. and the impact that it's had just on basic communication. 
and I think that's where we need to spend a lot more time. Um, you know, one of my roles is school safety, so we pay attention to the, the policies and procedures and how do we react to a crisis in the building, and which is great stuff, and we do need to spend time talking about that. I think schools are tremendously safer than they, they were 20 years ago mm -hmm. um, because we spend so much time focused on how we react to a crisis. And that's fine and well, but we need to spend just as much time, if not more, on how you prevent those crises from occurring. And it is building relationships. It is teaching kids how to interact with each other in a, in a safe way and be assertive, you know, in a respectful way. So it's not creating more conflict, but kids need to know they have a voice and they all have value and they have every right to express themselves just like anyone else in the room. Uh, so it's, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of helping them understand that it takes practice. It doesn't just come naturally to a lot of people and it's okay that it doesn't and it's okay to, to work on it. So thank you. So hi, I'm Donna, and I'm going to come at. Should we get down? Okay. Okay. So hi, I'm Donna, and I'm coming at this through the um, perspective of the parent. And so a lot of my information is going to be directed towards the families, uh, the caregivers. And um, I will start out by saying that I really struggled when I was trying to prepare for this, not only because there was so much information and there's so many pathways that you can go in with this um, topic, that the biggest reason why I struggle is that it hit me personally. It just brought up a lot of painful memories from my own childhood and from what my own son experienced. So I'm going to give you a little little uh, personal story and then I'm going to go into more of the details of like um, signs to look for and then some um, resources. So um, my personal story briefly is when I was younger, uh, school was basically a place of torment for me. Um, I was bullied and harassed a lot because number one, I'm short, or I, I should say I was short, that's the reason why they did it. I was short, I had glasses, I had braces for four years, I lived on a farm, we were poor, and the other piece was I had a learning disability. And so that was a target, you know, for whatever reason. And um, then to add on top of it, um, when I was eight, in eighth grade, and I still remember this feeling to this day, when I was in eighth grade, the principal, which in our generation, we did not deal with the principal because it was like, you didn't unless you were in trouble. So the principal was subbing and he had every one of us read individually in class. And out of 28 kids, I was the last one to read. Anxiety took over and when I went to speak, there was no sounds and then there was just like guttural noises and I just like was literally having a panic attack and so the principal's response to me was oh never mind you can't read anyways and that comment just created more of that torment from my peer group so surviving high school and then I grew up and when I say I grew up I, that means I got older I did not get taller <laughs> so um so going forward um, I became a parent and then my son was experiencing bullying for you know all the way up through the school years and after many years of being told uh, he was faggot he was gay he was retard he was stupid all these other horrible names um, it came to a head in like in high school where one, some of the students took him in gym class and brought him into the locker room with his clothes on and turned the wa the cold water on and just drenched him the worst part for me as a parent I felt like I couldn't I didn't know what to do. I didn't know really how to help him. I really felt like I failed him because it's like, what can I do for you? Because he got to the point where he didn't want to go to school and he was talking about harming himself and didn't want to live. So when you're a parent, what do you do with that? So, so that's, so I'm gonna just kind of switch gears now. And what I will say to you is I did talk to the school. We were able to um, come up with a plan and we just kind of just continued the process so he survived school eventually so anyways i'm going to switch gears and i want to talk to you about the signs of if you feel like your child is being bullied and i'm going to read this to you um it's these are some of the things to look for there's school refusal frequent stomach and headaches and other physical complaints agnation and moodiness uh, engaging in uh, negative self talk sleep disturbance which includes uh, nightmares or difficulty falling asleep Changes in eating habits, getting upset over a phone call, a text, or an email, bedwetting, appearing sad, lonely, anxious, or depressed with no uh, known cause, avoiding peer interactions after school and on weekends, talking about being alone at school, losing friends they previously had, 
increase in self-blame, feeling helpless or worthless, making negative statements about themselves, afraid of riding the bus, or even afraid of going and using the bathrooms at the schools. There would be sudden changes in school performance, any communication about suicide, such as no one would care if I was still alive. Being uh, more isolated and skipping activities they used to enjoy, spending more time alone in their rooms, and also the possibility of substance use. So as a caregiver, what are some things we can do? So I'm gonna give you a couple of things. Number one, listen. Listen without judgment and avoid assumptions and blaming. Provide a safe space for them. Ask, what can I do to help you? Try to be supportive, but neutral. Re um, react, okay, reacting too strongly may result in your child shutting down. Best time to talk with your child is after they're calm and after they had time to decompress from a long day at school. And if you're bullied at school as a child, try not to be to personalize what is happening. Your child's situation will most likely bring up painful memories, but don't take those, those problems on to, for yourself. Okay, second one would be no retaliation. So you may know the child, you may know the child's parents. Do not, and I'm gonna emphasize, do not go to them and try to make the kids sit down and work it out, unless you have a program like yours. Um, but don't do it personally because it usually doesn't work. It's very awkward and uncomfortable for both the kids, and it doesn't always pro solve the problem. And so it's difficult to hear that your child is being threatened and you want to immediately stop the hurt. Tempt him, but do not take the matters into your own hands and retaliate, uh, retaliate against the family or the bully. Instead, take a deep breath, which you need to do and think about what you can do to help your child handle what, she is, what she, he or she is facing. And the biggest thing that you can really do is to help them to learn how to problem solve. As parents, we should ask for help. Bullying can occur on a school bus, a playground, or in the cafeterias, with, and teachers may not be aware. As much as we think, oh, the teacher saw it, they may not be aware. And so it's important to ask for help so important to identify a trusted person at school if for your child to go to so they can uh, feel safe and they can have a sense of control and power. And obviously if you need to uh, create a safety plan, do that with the school too. And the biggest thing is let your child know he or she is not alone. And for the caregivers, get support for yourselves. Try to find somebody that you can talk to that's supportive, whether it's a family member, a friend, or someone at school, or faith-based community, anybody. You know, um, even here afterwards, you know, if, if you're feeling like you need to talk to somebody, find some other caretakers to, to connect with. Um, the biggest thing, the biggest piece that I would really want families to know is you're not alone and you didn't fail because you do, you feel like you fail when you aren't there to take that pain and stuff away for your child. And you're not alone and you did not fail. So one of the things that I would like to see that's changed is our culture. So we have a, a culture that teaches responsibilities and it teaches compassion, acceptance, respect, empathy, equality, and responsibility. And I wanna read this quote which I don't remember where I got it from, but it was said, bullying can cause long-term emotional harm for children. Whether it's physical, verbal, or emotional, it doesn't make a difference. It is all equally harmful and can lead to anxiety, depression, loneliness, suicidal ideation, and symptoms of PTSD later in life. It's not to be taken lightly. So, um, one of, one of my pieces is to talk about resources. So at the national level, there's uh, pacer.org has lots of information. Subbullying.gov has lots of information. Cyberbullyinghelp.com does. At the local state level, there's um, the Vermont Federation of Families and Cindy Tabor's here as, as a representative from VFF. And um, we also have peer, um, parent reps and family support providers through um, VF, VFF. 
And their job is you can actually help to talk and listen to the families and have them have somebody to talk to, help them go to meetings and support them through the process because um, it's really good to have somebody go in with you, especially if the situation, like, it's hot. You're still upset about what's going on. It's really good to have somebody go, sorry, right, somebody to come in with you. Um, other resources, you have the Restorative Center and um, at you have the Human Rights Commission, Vermont Legal Aid for like legal stuff. And I also want to bring up uh, Vermont Federation, no, Vermont Family Network. They have a document called Bullying and Harassment. Lots and lots of information in here. There's numerous resources over there that you guys are welcome to. And if you have something over there you don't, you want that we ran out of, we can get for you. And um, there's two other things. Uh, VFN has the Puppets in Education program where they have a puppet presentation that they do for bullying and there's one for ADHD. And there's also a new thing that we were just recently told about today, right Jessica? And yes. it was called, um, it's a it's an anti-bullying musical. It was created by Elaine Deva? Something like that. Deva uh, Skylar. And um, our local John Gilmore is the person who created the music for it. So it's a musical. It's called Bully No More. And we have a little contact information about that individual. But. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so all of these resources um, we're going to put up on the healthylamoilevalley.org on the blog by the end of the week. Um, going to kind of go down the table and get the names of the books and, and the names of the, the go-to resources. So that way you have those. Um, I'm going to just share briefly um, one of the, the most important things, you know, bullying, you know, we've talked a lot from the school perspective, but it doesn't always happen in the schools. You know, it happens in out of school time, it happens at home, it happens in the neighborhood. Um, but one of the most important things is to provide space for children to be heard. Um, and this can be done you know, in the home, but we also know that not every child has that type of home life. So that's where you know, the after school workers, uh, obviously the teachers, um, librarians, you know, next door neighbors, coaches, you know, each one of us has a role in, in connecting with the children in our lives. And so that's really important. Um, and if you have children in your life, um, really, especially if, if they're your own children, really working um, to create spaces um, and routines that allow for conversation. Um, on each of your tables, you have the parentupvermont.org. Um, this is a great website. It's by the Department of Health um, here in Vermont. And it just provides resources, how to have difficult conversations. But it really, it, it's about creating spaces um, and connecting with the youth in your life. You know, it could be, you know, playing games with them, you know, board games, you know, make a family ritual of, of playing board games. It could be, you know, just saying, hey, let's go play on the video game. You know, we, we often as adults are like, oh, those video games, you know, but that's what our kids like to do. So, you know, even if it's not your favorite thing, learning that game and spending time with them, asking them to teach you something. Um, and you may get some pushback at first. Um, creating a family meal, you know, um, the, the, that, just that ritual of, of spending that time once a week, you know, you know, chopping vegetables, you know, learning to cook. Maybe you're both learning together, you know. Um, those things are so important for our kids, those times. Um, and, you know, at, we, we have two kids, one's now uh, 10 and one's 12. And uh, my son, who's older, um, was, I think he was third or fourth grade. He, he came to us at bedtime. We kind of, you know, we read stories every night. We're still reading stories, even though they're starting to get older. Um, and he came and he's like, Mom, I'm seeing this at school. There's, there's this one kid who's always getting in trouble. And it was like, yeah, tell me about it. And he's like, you know, he, he's the one that the teachers are seeing. You know, he'll, he'll explode, he'll, he'll react. But there's three or four other kids in my classroom who are kind of poking at him. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll tease him, and, but they do it so quietly the teachers don't see it. And so I was like, wow, that's you know, really, really concerning. What do you want to do about it? And so we were able to go to the guidance. You know, I was like, do you want to talk to your guidance counselor? And so as a parent, we just you know, messaged our guidance counselor and said, 
you know, our son wants to talk to you. You know, he just shared something that he's seeing in this classroom dynamic. And so he was able to do that. And he didn't ever have to, like, you know, rat out. I mean, he was shared, but it wasn't punitive. It was really restorative in nature. The guidance counselor, you know, didn't expose, you know, our son and say, this child told me, you know, it, he kept it on the down low, but then he went in and did some work in the classroom with all the kids in the classroom. And then he, he might have done a lunch bunch with some of those kids that were kind of, you know, the ones that were, were instigating. And, and so the, the, it, that situation really started to resolve itself in that classroom. And so, but that came out of a time, you know, that we were just, you know, reading a story and snuggling before bed. So really encourage you to find those times with your kids, you know, um, even if they're not the ones necessarily getting bullied, it's important for them to, to be able to talk, to, to, you know, kind of dissect their day. Um, you know, a lot of what Healthy Lamoille Valley's work is, is substance abuse prevention. And strong relationships are the, the number one protective factor in that. Um, and bullying, unfortunately, is, is a cause of substance abuse uh, for a lot of our youth. You know, if they don't feel heard, they don't feel like there's anywhere they can express that pain that they're feeling, um, they're, they're more likely to turn to substances. So, um, so really encourage you, um, if you're a coach, a librarian, a volunteer, you know, take time to you know, get to know those kids. You know, if you're a parent, get to know the other kids, you know, your children's classmates. You know, as they get older, it gets harder to volunteer in their classrooms, but find those ways to connect. You know, Maybe they're on a sports team and it's, it's bringing snack, you know, bringing some cut up oranges, you know, just so that you're starting to build a rapport with the kids in your child's age cohort. You know, and if you're a, just a community member, neighbor, you know, find out what they're interested in and get them to tell you about it. Because kids, when they're excited about something, they love to talk about it. And sometimes it takes a while to find what kids are, you know, excited about. They'll just kind of mumble and, and look down um, because it's awkward to talk to grown-ups. Um, but really, you know, taking that time, you know, and maybe it's a color, you know, that they're, you know, they're always wearing blue. You know, hey, is blue your favorite color? And find those commonalities. It doesn't have to be big, deep things. Start simple and then, then move in just because relationships really count. Um, so thank you all for sharing. Um, we're going to move into a time about five minutes, five to seven minutes of a break. Um, everyone, that way you can stretch. Uh, there's lots of refreshments still back there. Uh, take a, a bathroom break. And then on your table are index cards. Really encourage you to write down questions. You can write down your own questions. You can write down questions on behalf of the children in your life. Um, and the, we'll collect those, and then I'll read the question. If you'd like to direct it to a specific person, feel free to write that on there as well. So, uh, so about five to seven minutes for a break. Thank you. So while people are kind of making their way back, Ryan brought up a, a point that we've been using the word bullying, but we haven't probably defined it super well. Um, so he's going to define that for us as, as people are kind of coming back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I just, you know, kind of as we were talking, it, it, it kind of clicked that we, didn't, we hadn't really talked about what, what really is bullying. Um, and by definition, because that's what my, my fear was everyone was going to leave here and then when they talk to their kids and something happened to school, they're going to call up and say that their kid was being bullied, which may not be the case. Um, really, the, the threshold for bullying is if it's repeated behavior towards that, towards that child. Um, so one interact, one poor interaction that may, you know, be inappropriate or has caused some level of harm is should absolutely be re reported and addressed to the school. It just may not trigger a, an actual bullying investigation. Um, and I would, I would hate to, for people to, to go and say, hey, look, my kid's being bullied, and then be disappointed that that's not triggering the same level of, of reaction, maybe. I mean, every, every poor interaction that your child experiences should absolutely be addressed if it's happening at school. So it's not to, to shy away from making reports, but just understand there is a threshold that is, everything gets evaluated against. And same with harassment. We haven't really talked about that. But there's, there's specific criteria for it to actually fall into a category to be classified as a, as a bullying or harassment investigation. You know, we still want to encourage people, kids to report when they're being mistreated by their, by their classmates and peers and to have those open discussions and to be able to address it because that helps the school know what the climate is like within the building. Um, because you know, we've talked about it before, if, if things are occurring but they're not being reported to us, it's really hard for us to, to react to that 
and it's really hard to address it. So it's all the more important to build those conversations into the day or those those mechanisms in order to report information. Um, but I just want to make sure, you know, bullying it has to be repeated behavior um, over, over a period of time. That period of time is not necessarily defined. So because there's some things that happen from year to year. So I wanted to follow up. Thank you very much for giving us uh, the legal definitions. And I have copies of a policy that addresses those um, definitions here. I know that all of us feel that whether it rises to a legal definition of bullying or harassment, or whether it's misconduct or disrespectful behavior, the impact it has on someone is what we ultimately will look for and look to remedy. Um, we don't want our kids to feel uh, rejected. They may call it bullying, you know, uh, and in some cases will rise to that formal investigation, um, but we take all behaviors seriously. I'm gonna add on that as well, just we talked a lot about kids that are being bullied, but we haven't talked about the kids that do the bullying. And so the same thing goes. I means kids can feel very rejected and very afraid because now they're being labeled as the bully as well. Mm -hmm. Many kids that we've worked with in schools, they don't see their behavior as bullying. So it's a lot of, you know, looking at misperceptions or perceptions and communication and whether you do that together with who accused them or not based on what's best for everyone. But reminding that some people are not doing it for intentional hurt, some people are. And how do we break that down? Well, and also defying, defying, <laughs> defining, there we go, well defying, I guess, how to support families when they're not recognizing that some of those behaviors are bullying and triggering to other kids? Is it some sort of family norm? Is it learned behavior? Mm -hmm. Is it out in the world? It doesn't just happen in school. Um, so how do we support and sort of I'm going to be a therapist for like a second when you're peeling back the layers of figuring out what's motivating the behavior for the kiddo how do you help support shifting that um, mm -hmm. so that's over it so we've had a few questions come in and uh, did, did somebody have want to say add one more thing uh, yes <laughs> okay. so perspective that was the key word that made me think of this so part of building a relationship is understanding someone's perspective we have seen, you know, last year and a, a few, in few uh, situations this year, at the very early elementary level, some of our kiddos saying some really aggressive, using aggressive words mm -hmm. of violence. And understanding when we're talking to them that this is language they hear that is acceptable to them mm -hmm in their homes because it's part of their norm. Mm -hmm. So part of our work is helping them understand what they mean when they say these mm -hmm. words mm -hmm. and how those words are perceived and how we can work together to make sure we have common language around pro-social behaviors. We're gonna to turn to questions and if a question creates, an, or the answer to a question creates another question, do feel free to just kind of raise your hand and, and bring it out at that time. So we don't have to wait until it's written down. So, because um, we do want this to be a, a dialogue as well. Um, if there is a student witnessing bullying that does not want to be a bystander, but that also is afraid of standing up for the victim, what should that student do? Go for it. You go ahead. So, uh, <laughs> so um, I would encourage that student to identify someone who is a safe person for that student, whether that's another peer or whether it's an adult in the building, whether it's a family member, because we're all trying to do this together. And my hope would be that there would be at least one person who might help that student have a conversation. So when you say that, are you meaning the student that wants to report it, so it's a safe person for them or a safe person for the student that's being bullied? Well, if I understood the question, it was, what if you witness something yeah. but you don't feel comfortable right. saying so, so for that student? Okay. Good. We've, just to kind of piggyback on that, you know, we've, we've been encouraging the, you know, if you see something, say something mm -hmm. kind of motto within the school. 
And, and it is true, to find someone that you feel comfortable talking to, even if it's not addressing it right in that moment, but to not just keep it to themselves and, and worry about it. They don't have to own it, so we try to take that off their shoulders. Um, with so many factors, uh, games, social media, difficult family situations, et cetera, causing disconnection among our youth and lack of understanding and empathy, what is the most effective way to counteract these negative forces and bring youth together? I mean, I guess I would say, and I'm sure everybody up here has something to say about this, because I think we're all, we have the same mind um, about making sure that they have opportunities to uh, talk about things that are hard. And finding the adult in their life, um, ideally it would be an, an adult either in their family or in the school, but any adult in their life um, to be able to have those, those conversations. Uh, and really encouraging uh, when the conversations are hard to have them. And I think uh, in our culture, especially right now, uh, there is a, um, a tendency for us to not want to do that. People are fearful about having those conversations. And so, um, you know, even in my own agency, I'm pushing my staff to have hard conversations when each with each other when things are hard. And at home, I'm sort of always reminding myself that sometimes conversations are hard with my kids and you know, in our family, and to really lean into those hard conversations and encourage others to do that too. And really, sorry, and really sometimes it doesn't have to be an adult. Sometimes with kiddos, they're really gonna wanna do some peer support, and hopefully in that peer support, they'll be one of those kids that wants to empower other kids and support them through that. And I think um, as much as I want to cry about losing the 16 year old child off to you know peers it's also hoping that the peer group helps support each other um, there was something else that popped in my head when you were talking but it's gone I'm gonna go off yeah. that one though which okay. is even back to the first question which is if you don't feel like you can say something to that large group to make it stop you could go to that kid that was being bullied after the fact and say hey I saw that happening I didn't like that I didn't know what to do but I'm sorry that happened. Mm -hmm. Do you want to, mm -hmm. how could I help you next time? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the peer conversation is really important. And I'd say in terms of connection, it is hard in this day and age. I mean, I'm a parent and yes, my kid watches screen time while I make dinner. And when we turn it off, does he not want to turn it off and have dinner? Yes. <laughs> but in, it's easier to just let him keep watching TV than it is to deal with the struggle of, now I have to set a limit, we have to follow through and how am I going to make it happen? So I think there's a, part on us as parents and caregivers to follow through not just the hard conversation but the hard moment mm -hmm. of transition to then re-engage with our kids to be like I'm so happy to be with you mm -hmm. even though that was hard I'm really happy to be with you um, and then help you make like extracurricular activities what kind of clubs what kind of sports and do we have a disparity based on location remote and rural areas and finances around who can engage in activities after school. So how do we manage that? Mm -hmm. I was, so, go ahead. Yeah, so just kind of on a, like a, on a small scale, um, you know, both my kids go to the school that I work in, which I don't know how excited they are about that, but <laughs> it's, uh, you know, we're working through it. And, but what's something really special, you know, I've talked to my principal about this before, and what I've noticed just having worked in a couple of different schools and just seeing different climates and how students interact with each other, and, you know, we have a very strict no cell phone policy within our building. And, you know, it's a small student body, so it's pretty easy to, to, to kind of monitor, although there's those that will push the limits. Um, but in general, what I've noticed or what has been really kind of refreshing to see is that at lunchtime, there's no phones out. At break times, there's no phones out. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. are forced to have conversations and talk with each other. And we have a small student lounge so we can see them in the afternoons. And there, there's groups of them, you know, there'll be a dozen kids sitting there and they're all chatting and, you know, kind of carrying on. And, and but they're interacting with each other. They're not, their face isn't in a screen. And they're, they're forced to have those conversations with their peers. And it's just, you don't see that everywhere. And that's kind of a, it's kind of a neat and, you know, for, I love my phone just like everyone else. But to see that it is possible to not have it out and to be able to set those, mm -hmm kind of habits now that you should be talking to your friends and, and having good conversations. And so it's interesting. So that really underscores where policy can go a long way to help kids, you know, set that down. Because often our kids aren't going to set those devices down on their own. Um, and I was going to kind of piggyback on the, the after school activities. 
uh, is finding those activities in your community. I know that we are rural, you know, we don't have the YMCA or the Boys and Girls Club, but we do have libraries, you know, and I, I know I mentioned libraries earlier, but so many of our libraries along the Route 15 corridor have amazing uh, youth services librarians, and they have, you know, programs for various age groups, um, and that's a great way just to get kids out and engaged, you know, you know, even if they don't want to do a sport where they have to commit to a whole season, you know, they can, you know, find an activity. I think there's Harry Potter clubs, there's Dungeons and Dragons, there's knitting and sewing and, you know, various art, you know, some of the libraries even occasionally have a cooking program. So finding something that resonates with your child, or if they, there isn't anything that resonates, you know, going to the library with your child and saying, hey, We'd love to see programming in this, because I know our, our youth services librarians are always, especially for that teen, tween age, they're always looking for ideas of what will they come to. Um, and then we also have two teen centers um, in our region. I know they're down in Morrisville, um, but those are great resources, um, you know, depending on your, your child's personality, you know, that gets them, you know, ping pong, you know, foosball, air hockey, all those sort of things are things that, that engage kids and it's kind of hard to swing a ping pong paddle and also be on your phone. So, um, so just those opportunities. So. Um, how do you handle bullying as an adult child? Can, and would anybody like to clarify? Okay. How do you handle bullying as an adult child? Hmm. So you have an adult child that's bullied. Or so. as an adult right now. Mm -hmm. Or as an adult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, we were talking about earlier is it, I mean, we, we, a lot of our focus right now is about in the school, but you know, bullying occurs mm -hmm. across the board. It doesn't matter how old you are. It can happen in the workplace. And, you know, mm -hmm. just is a, a reoccurring issue. But I think learning, working on those skills for being assertive when you have being confronted with something is, is critical. I think we might call it more grown-up stuff, like how do you combat racism and how do you combat sexism, you know, for adults, but it's still very much the same premise. So how, I mean, I think about it, at least in my own family system, like you get into roles and routines and you tease each other and this and that, but at a certain point, you got to say, I actually don't find that funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so can you not call me that anymore? or? I know you're telling a story, but that wasn't really funny. And how, and as an adult, it is, it is hard to stand up and say. But that's the modeling we do for our kids in that moment of, wait, I'm uncomfortable. That wasn't awesome. Let's try, can we try that again? Um, so I think there's a lot of that. I think it's hard for adults too, because you're trying to manage possibly anxiety, insecurity, fear, and you don't necessarily want to change anything. And sometimes bullying can be considered hilarious, kind of like what she was saying. Somebody might think it's just great. The other person may not. So I don't feel like it's that different. I, I feel like they need to empower themselves, be available to at least speak and say, no, thank you, this is not working for me. And if they can't, to help affect um, a support system to do that for them. And that support system can be made up of friends. Who else would you suggest to create a support system for an adult? Definitely friends, community members, faith groups. Um, you can always come on over to mental health. There's lots of support groups over there, too. I mean, I don't know if you really want to jump quite that far, but there's support there. Um, and I feel like adults often don't label it as bullying, but that's definitely what's what they could, yeah. And Again, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but trauma, the relationship with trauma and, and bullying. Adults definitely um, probably don't think of it that way. I, I surely didn't. Um, as I was thinking about it, like trying to prepare for this, I was like, hmm, how do I integrate that? But I was thinking more of family systems. So I just want to speak to, I think uh, like Ryan talked about there being a very specific standard around bullying in schools, there is a equivalent standard um, in the adult world when people are feeling harassed. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and the same sort of protocol applies in that um, people should absolutely f find their peers and find people that they feel comfortable talking to it about. And um, it's also the place to call the police mm -hmm. or to go to the, the courthouse to um, talk about the feeling of being harassed. And there are ways 
um, for our justice system to make sure that you're safe in that way. Um, so I think it's really that harassment line is like the bullying line is very clear um, and it's also can be easily crossed for people who are feeling bullied um, into a very dangerous place that um, the justice system as a whole takes really seriously. Um, so if people want more information about that, Ryan or I would be happy to talk more about how to access those services. And if you're unsure mm -hmm. about it, does it cross that line or not, and you need someone to talk to again, mm -hmm. you can contact the same people. But you can also check in with your friends or family yeah. or check in with mental health, because sometimes what, if you have a history of trauma, you might feel like you're being persecuted or you might feel like somebody is doing something to you that is really intentional and negative, and it may not be the case, but it doesn't mean your feelings aren't valid. That's right. Mm -hmm. So making sure that you are hurt. So if you ever do feel like you are being harassed or something is really upsetting to you, everybody deserves a space to have a voice to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, how can we make it so, oh, 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 have a follow up, okay. Uh, with uh, diversity, uh, how would bullying dealt with because I found that a lot of the schools, at least where my grandson went, didn't understand the culture difference. And so how would, how would you all be able to help a child of color who's being bullied, harassed, and it's been taken to uh, someone in authority, but it's more seen on the other side than on that child's side. And I, I mean, I found that diversity is, is a lot of it is not, it's really not understood. Can I just, Barbara, to speak to that question. Um, Can you there repeat was, the question? It, so Barbara was asking questions around understanding diversity and students, of, particularly students of color in schools. Um, and in, in Vermont, there was a report done a couple years ago by Legal Aid, which determined that um, kids with um, disabilities, uh, learning disabilities, and kids of color were two to three times more likely to be suspended from school. So what that pointed to was what, exactly what you're asking about, which is um, a different cultural awareness and absolutely a different response when kids with learning disabilities uh, and or kids, students of color, um, acted in the same way that other students did. So that's really a big part of the reason that we need to make sure, it's a big part of the reason that the Agency of Education and people like CAT are investing in making sure that we're including all students and all students are at the table um, so that we're not making assumptions about what they need and who they are and that uh, the relationship is there when things get hard and we're not clear um, and, and there's a, a a different response than exclusion, which has been the response, I think, historically. When kids did something bad, they were kicked out and um, suspended. And what we now know is that's absolutely the worst thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and isolation of kids or adults in general makes things much, much worse for them and then for the community in terms of safety. So we need to, when things are hard, uh, remind ourselves to sort of wrap our arms tighter around those students and uh, around people in our community who are challenging us um, or who we don't understand well enough. So I want to really applaud you for bringing that up, Barbara, and it's absolutely something that has been the case in Vermont, and I, I know a lot of schools um, across the state, especially ours, are really working on that. I would say um, to, to um, supplement what Heather was saying, the inclusive environment includes talking to kids about, and to, to everyone in that community, about respect. What does it mean to respect someone and respect someone's opinion even if you don't agree with it? Um, respect where someone is coming from even though it may not be uh, something that you know about. Um, so it's tolerance, it's respect, it's just, it's, it's learning how to be a friend to everyone in your community. And if schools can do that well, those children will graduate and be out in the real world with those skills so that they can work with and be around anyone. We're all going to have people that we don't see eye to eye with. But it's how we manage that 
that I think will, um, will dictate how well we're doing and how successful we're being. And it goes to a staff level for supervision yeah. to make sure that yeah. as adults and as staff that we are checking in with ourselves and each other around, am I only seeing things through, through this lens? Mm -hmm. How inclusive am I being? So, all from the kids to the adults as well. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, how can we make it so bullying does not start to begin with? And I think, Kat, you addressed this a little bit earlier, um, but do you want to expand on prevention? Sure. I, mean, I think it, it starts with relationships. It doesn't start in high school where you think, okay, <laughs> now we have to do something. It starts in the home. It starts in the child's first access to other children. Mm -hmm. It starts by training the people who, who um, run those facilities in, in, in um, building that, that community. Mm -hmm. um, it, it can't, I mean, it, it has to start at the earliest level and at the earliest ages. I mean, that's how we learn tolerance. That's mm -hmm. how we learn respect. That's how we learn how to talk to people, how to be a friend to someone, how we navigate social situations. They always start out, I mean, if you think of the child who leaves preschool after the first week, all smiles. How often do we see that <laughs> with the, the teen, teenage child at the end of a school year? Not nearly enough. <laughs> so. If we do a better job at the earlier levels, I think we'll have um, more teenagers smiling when they leave school at the end of the day. And you, oh, I'm sorry. I, just, I, mean, I would just like to share, share my personal experience. Some of my children have been in this district since they were in preschool and went to Cambridge Elementary. And Cambridge Elementary does an exemplary job of that from day one. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's embedded in their language and yep. their activities. I think in Mrs. Anderson's approach and response, and I think that, um, that I just, you know, I, I think it's created, um, and not that, it, that bullying happens every place, and it happens in Cambridge too, but I think the environment and the intentional conversations and the response um, has been beautiful mm -hmm. from day one. Mm -hmm. and, and it's been wonderful for my children to have that experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Is that it? Um, real, real quick also, <laughs> I just wanted to add, um, we had, were talking a lot about, um, we touched on briefly earlier, the, about people who are bullied, and I just feel like how do we prevent bullying to begin with, it's, we have to remember that hurt people hurt people, mm -hmm. right? And so often, the people who are hurting people are the people who are unheard, who are invalidated, so it really, it, it, that, that foundation of creating relationships it's, it starts in the primary and early levels, and early childhood education levels, but it really has to amplify to the adults that are in these people's lives, in these children's lives, because, you know, we look at mentors. We don't have a lot of mentors in our community, right? There's not a lot of men, um, especially males. We have quite a lot of females that are available to help, but male mentors, there's a real low number. And that's a huge problem with the boys and the, uh, you know, the teenage boys and the adolescents. We do have teen centers that are great, that's fabulous. But not everyone wants to do that, not everyone wants to play sports, you know, and you have those that fall between the cracks, whatever. My point is that some of those, I, I was talking with someone recently, we're like, well, what is the issue? Why are there not a lot of adults available? Well, how many of the adults have unsolved issues that they're not dealing with? And those unheard traumas and those unheard things. And so it's like they're not available to be available to the young people because they themselves are not okay. And so just like we were talking earlier about the jokes and the subtle things in our everyday common language with each other, it's creating that sense of community and that common language <laughs> common language for um, pro-social behavior um, amongst adults, I feel like because why is bullying? Because there are differences, mm -hmm. right? And that tolerance and that acceptance that is not there. And people bully because you don't have the same, which and that's the thing, to accept difference. No one's the same. And if we're all the same, what kind of world do we live in? Yeah. But I just feel like 
in order to prevent bullying from starting in the first place, we have to be better. I tell my children three things every day before they leave your school. Be a good person, make good choices, learn something. <laughs> That's all I'm asking. I'm not asking for a whole lot. We have to be better people ourselves. We have to teach our children to be better people. And we have to lead by example. And that's how you can to lead starting in the first place. But honoring people's trauma and experiences so that everyone can heal, the adults, so that we can care for the young people, you know? So that they see us being heard, and then we can also then reflect that and hear them. And then they can hear each other, right? Thank you. Those were, those were really great points and great stories. And I think so often, you know, we also need to take that step back and look, kind of look at ourselves too and say, am I exhibiting this behavior? Am, am I passing things on, even, you know, unintentionally, that may be creating a, a situation of inequity? And then once you realize that, those, those two words, or actually more, but I'm sorry, you know, actually apologizing to the kids in our life and saying I was wrong, you know, we need to do this differently, we need to think about this differently. And the power of the adults in the community doing that has an amazing impact on our kids. Um, so I have one more question here, and I know our time is also getting short. Um, are there other questions on the floor that people would like to make sure they get asked that are? Okay, so we'll end with this one. Um, and then um, if there's any closing remarks real quick, then we'll um, do that. So what does a zero tolerance policy actually mean? And is it the same for our lesser able population as well? So this would be in the school setting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, I can't speak for how other people use that phrase. I know what I'm believe it to mean, and I know what we um, talk to our staff about it mean, meaning, and our students, we don't have any tolerance for, um, for, for bullying, harassment, or hazing, or misconduct, or disrespect. There will be conversations. It depends on what the situation is. Um, I don't think it's okay for someone to be a bystander and not do anything about it. So, so our staff, um, they know that that's not okay. Um, people are expected to intervene. If the adults in our world are expected to intervene, we have zero tolerance for behavior that is hurtful to our students. Does that mean it's not gonna happen? No. It means we're gonna take steps to work through it. And again, for anybody who's interested, we have policies and procedures right here and I will invite anybody to come and talk to me in person about anything um, related to, to this um, and what we're doing in our schools. That's what zero tolerance means to me. Is there any other thoughts on that? I just, I, I completely agree with what, what Kat was saying as far as, you know, that it needs to be really clear what the expectations are, you know, both student and staff and reacting to, to something that it is consistent across the board because the students pick up on where those inconsistencies are and are, are quick to point them out. Um, so I think being really consistent and clear with the expectations is, is critical. Um, but I think also looking at the, the situation as a whole because there isn't one answer for every mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. So how do you make sure that the, your, the solution fits what's, what's going on? So. Granted, the to there's zero tolerance for the behavior, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the reaction is going to be exactly the same in every situation. Exactly right. It needs, to, it needs mm -hmm. to fit appropriately. Does anybody on our panel have closing? Oh, did, were you going to say, did you want to add? No? Okay. Um, did anybody on our panel want to have closing remarks? I wanted to just say how thankful I am for everybody who came out tonight to hang out with us and, and have a conversation. One of the number one things that I hoped would happen is that there would be an awareness, but not only is there an awareness of this topic, but now you have um, some amazing people that you can connect with if you leave here tonight and go, you know, I really wanted to ask this question and I didn't realize it till now. So I, I hope that you reach out to all of us and we keep this conversation going because there's a lot more people that would benefit from this and 
be in the room with us. Mm -hmm. um, and awareness is going to help educate and make sure that we are doing the very best we can for our kids in the community. Mm -hmm. And I would um, reiterate again my invitation to have any of you come and talk to me. And hopefully not just about what we're doing. I'd like to know what you're doing or mm -hmm. what you think has worked in the past or what, what kinds of things haven't worked and why. Because I think that, and I call it collective intelligence, that when you have a lot of ideas and, and multiple people thinking about them, you ultimately will have a better resolution. I would say I'm also really grateful that you all came out. Um, I think it's a sign that we're moving in a different direction even by having the conversation. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm really encouraged by that and I focus as much as I can on hopeful conversations like that, this about what we can do as opposed to trying to focus on all that's wrong with the rest of the world. This is a place that we can affect change um, and I, like Kat, really look to all of you for um, ideas and support and um, thinking about how to make that happen. So this might be the beginning of something else that I hope um, we continue to wrestle with around the bullying issue because I think it's so relevant to all of us. Um, I think one of the things I noticed was that we all seem to be kind of on the same page, which was reassuring. Um, <laughs> and that I think it is moving in a, in, in, a, in a good direction. I think it's just continuing to have those conversations and encouraging parents to to come in and have conversations as well around these topics, especially if they're hearing stuff, and to to really recognize that it is going to take everyone being involved. It's not just a school issue. It's not just at home. Right. It's you know everyone needs to work together, and that way the messages are consistent across the board as mm -hmm. well. Um, so students, when they come to school, they know what the expectations are. They know what the expectations are when they go home, and everyone's kind of working together on it. Versus, it's very easy to get a lot of mixed messages right now. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I'd like to add, um, I definitely agree that it's important that we change our culture and we continue this discussion. So for me, it's like, I don't want us to be leaving here going, oh, this was great. Then what? So I really would like to see us be able to continue the discussion and do, I don't know if you're going to talk about next steps or not, but if you are or are not, I was going to throw that at you. <laughs> and then the other piece is to really um, reach our youth because we really, really need to hear their voices too. And one of the messages I would like everybody to leave with is you're not alone. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, yeah, thank you for all, all of you for coming and thank you to our panelists. Um, stick around. You know, I know sometimes people may need to, to, to jet, but if you can, just stick around, talk to somebody, at least talk to one person before you leave the room. Um, that's one of those next steps is building relationship. And this is a great opportunity to do that. So uh, we'll be here for a few more minutes, take resources. Um, on our, with the blog post that we'll put up, we'll put all of our contact information. So that's another great step is you know, to say, how can I tie in? How can I support this work? How can I, you know, you know, in what I'm already doing, how can I interweave you know, some of these principles? And I think you know, just taking one takeaway, you, know, you all have note cards on your table, I encourage you just to write one thing that you're gonna take with you and put into your practice in your life. That's a great next step. Um, you, you can share that with somebody or you can just take it and put it on your bulletin board at work and just have that visual reminder of, oh yeah, I'm gonna, gonna listen and really listen and not be thinking of the next thing I say. You know, simple things like that make a big difference. So, um, so thank you and uh, have a nice evening. Drive safe. Do people give email?